Hey everybody, it's well after school, and here you are listening to Mr. Olson talk to you again. Unless, of course, you weren't here, then this will be your first time. And that's kind of the advantage of recording these notes. This is the first time I am recording these notes with uh, any audio. Um, and I just want to let you know, um, if there's anything that you like, please let me know. If there's anything you don't like, let me know so we can kind of make some adjustments and see if you like it. Um, I also want to tell you that everything in this presentation is going to be the beginning part of a very large unit that we're going to call unit four that involves all the sections from chapter four that's one two three four five and six and it's also going to involve uh, a mixture of uh, sections from chapters 20 21 and 22 because we're also going to talk about plant parts in this unit um, it's going to be supersized it's going to be pretty pretty heavy in terms of content but i think we will be able to accomplish that goal of learning everything we need to learn in a relatively short period of time so here we go let's go ahead and talk about chemical energy and atp so the first thing i want to talk about is something called atp adenosine triphosphate i'm just going to let you know right now adenosine triphosphate is the full name of this this molecule and you are going to have to know that full name on a test when it comes up i know it's day one i know it's the first time we're talking about this but you are going to have to know that now atp is going to be the energy molecule that we use in our cells by um breaking down food molecules uh to actually give us energy to our cells now there's two processes that are mostly associated with using these this, this molecule they're called cellular respiration which you see in red on your screen and photosynthesis which you see green on your screen uh, i just want to point out to you that um almost all life depends on photosynthesis we're, we're going to get into why if that's actually true but uh we me and you most animals use this process of cellular respiration and it's very important for us um basically i just want you to know that both these processes are going to be a main focus of this chapter this unit uh, and atp is going to be involved in both of those processes and i also want to tell you that we are going to get crazy crazy more detailed on photosynthesis in this very presentation but later on we will get more uh, detailed on cellular respiration and i'll give you a little bit of information on this on this lecture but Cellular respiration can get pretty complex because it makes a lot of energy. We're talking a ton of energy. And there's even a, a, a more simple process called glycolysis and another process called fermentation, which we will be talking about later on. So these molecules we see here, um, these are going to be examples of what they actually look like. ATP, adenosine triphosphate. It's directly related to what we see in uh, our nucleotides for DNA. For our nucleic acids um, this is actually the molecule adenine and adenine is added to this goofy um, sugar which we call it adenosine and then we add three phosphate groups to it now the third phosphate here is going to uh, be pretty unstable and when that breaks off what we'll end up doing is we'll end up turning this once we break this guy off uh, once it goes away we will end up with a two molecule i'm sorry two phosphate molecule called a d p adenosine diphosphate so this third phosphate group like i was saying is extremely unstable and it breaks off very easily now when it breaks off that's when we see the energy become available and after um, we release that phosphate it now turns into adp now this isn't meaning it's just worthless now what we actually get to do is we get to reuse this molecule. We can recharge it by reattaching another phosphate back onto there. It's kind of like the currency of a cell. And in class, I used this analogy previously. I said, this is kind of like a gift card. Your gift card you've got, let's say you've got $100 on it. If you spend all the money on your gift card, you don't have to throw away your gift card. You can take it back to the store. You can add more money to it and then you can reuse the gift card or i guess a better analogy would be a debit card because that's something people use all the time um and your debit card just takes money out of your bank account and if you have no money in your bank account you wouldn't throw away your debit card you just wait until you add more money to your bank account so the cycle between atp and adp is seen here we start off with atp a high energy molecule it's got the three phosphates 
And then as we follow down through here, we can see we remove that phosphate, we release our energy, and this now becomes a DP. There's only two phosphates here. As we decide that our body needs to have another high energy molecule, we can add another phosphate, and we'd go ahead and add that potential energy back onto our molecule until the time we determine that we want to break it all off. Yeah, I made all these animations. I know you're really jealous. Deal with it. Now, food is pretty important. You know you got to eat it. But one thing that we talked about previously in chapter two of your textbook were these things called carbon-based molecules. Now, the carbon-based molecules we depend on, we also know them as macromolecules, are going to be carbohydrates. But we do depend on other molecules inside of our body for energy. Um, we can burn lipids, fats, inside of our body. These lipids um, actually do a really good job of providing us much more energy than just carbohydrates. But we don't like to do that. It's, a, it's kind of our second choice because we figure it's better to store these molecules than to use these molecules. Proteins can be broken down for energy as well, but they are really our last resort. We don't like to use them. Uh, that's because your body tissues are made up of proteins, and when we decide to burn those up, we're deciding to des destroy part of our body, which means we're not going to be as functional as we once were. I put this illustration up here just to show you the idea that different kinds of foods can, can kind of give us different ideas uh, about how much energy they give us. Now, I just want to point this out to you. Um, the calories that you see here are the lowercase c. They're not the capital C calories. Um, lowercase c calories are much smaller than the big C calories. The big C calories, the one you find on your food here in the United States. These little guys are little tiny calories. But either way around, nine calories per milligram means for every thousandth of a gram of butter, in this case, we see nine calories created. For proteins, we see four calories created per milligram, and ca uh, carbohydrates do the same thing by using four, uh, giving us four calories per milligram, but the difference is we're not mostly structurally made up of uh, carbohydrates, so proteins, once they go away, it's kind of a bad thing. I mean, really think about it. This protein here is a chicken, and that's the muscle of a chicken. I mean, if you start burning that up, the chicken's not going to be able to move around, do things. They won't have muscle structure. Down here in carbohydrates, all you're really losing is, I don't know, sugar. Now that we are, now that we kind of talked about energy, I want to mention the one thing that's very special about some organisms that, that use this energy. One example will be something called chemosynthesis. Chemosynthesis is going to be the form of generating energy, but it doesn't use light as its source of energy. It uses chemicals. Actually, when we look at the word chemosynthesis, chemo means chemical and synthesis means making. So they're making energy from chemicals. If you think about the word photosynthesis, photo means light. So it's making something from light. And chemical synthesis means we're getting chemicals from around the organism to actually give it ATP. So it is still using ATP. It just uses it in a totally different source. One example of this is found in these things called black smokers. Uh, they're at the bottom of the ocean, and that's areas that we see a lot of geothermic activity. Since we're seeing that activity, it's very warm. Uh, the smoke kind of billows out. It's not really smoke. It's just kind of a, a dust plume, if you will. Um, and it kind of billows out at high temperatures, and it kind of settles those chemicals down around the base of those vents. A common organism we find around there is something called a tube worm. Um, that means they can survive despite their very cold and dark conditions um, where they actually you know, thrive in, in good numbers here. Um, I should also point out hydrogen sulfide is a chemical that is deadly to you and I, uh, but these guys thrive on the stuff. And uh, there's actually a good number of other chemicals that they use too. I like this diagram because it kind of shows how this works um, in a little bit more easy to see way. Um, we start off with seawater around two degrees Celsius. Now that is really cold. Um, that's just below, uh, just above freezing in, in the Celsius realm. Um, and what we do is we force water in through here 
and then the water will start to heat up because we have a magma source that's pretty close to the surface and as it gets close to that it's going to warm up and it's going to drop off some of these cool little chemicals that eventually are pushed throughout uh, the actual plume the vent and then it enters that ocean uh, and kind of settles back down and it can kind of feed or nourish uh, these tube worms and you also notice there are some other uh, directions that we can get some warmer water without having like overbearingly hot water so it's kind of at a nice warm bath area so they can survive in a nice comfortable environment all right everybody so now we're going to talk about the process called photosynthesis this is going to be chapter four section two of your textbook and this is just a light introduction and it will get pretty complicated towards the end um, because we're going to talk about light independent and light dependent reactions i know that sounds foreign to you right now but you will be comfortable with it trust me um, and i also want to point out to you that a lot of these concepts that we do see in this section should be kind of a review they, they should be something you're already somewhat familiar with so let's say I'm on the side of the road, being a crazy person that I probably am, and I'm saying, the side, it makes sugar. If I was saying that, you would think I'm crazy. But the fact is, it does in a way. The sun is used to make sugars by plants constantly, all the time. It's always happening. Um, and plants, by the way, don't just use solar energy. They also take in stuff like carbon dioxide and water, and then they turn that into sugar and as well as a uh, little oxygen that we like to breathe. Now, photosynthesis takes place in the plant cell organelle called a chloroplast. You should remember this because we learned this in the last chapters, chapter three, where we learned about all the different organelles. And we even said chloroplasts were, were unique to um, plants because they have that greenish hue, which makes plants look green. Mm -hmm. So these chloroplasts, that was my cell phone, please don't judge me. These chloroplasts contains another molecule called chlorophyll. Now, chlorophyll's job is to absorb light from the sun, gets kind of excited, and allows energy to be transferred. Now, uh, I also want to mention to you, chloroplast of three parts. One part's called a thylakoid, which looks like a green pancake, kind of stacked. Um, and when they form that stack of pancakes, a short stack, a tall stack, um, that is going to be called the grana. And then all that extra space found within the chloroplast is called the stroma. This formula is extremely important. Please commit it to memory because it is so vital to life on Earth. Everything depends on this. And I just want to mention to you, this is what we call a balanced equation. So you'll see these big number sixes in front of some of these molecules. And this big molecule over here doesn't have any number in front. That's because uh, we're trying to balance things out. You'll learn way more about it in chemistry and I won't actually hold you to it. So anyway let, let, let me just try to mention what the formula actually is we have carbon dioxide we have water and we have light energy from the sun and those things in the process of photosynthesis make sugar c6h12o6 and oxygen gas now this is pretty nice because we want both sugars and we want oxygen gas to survive and while we do need we do need water plants require water and they take in that stuff that we don't want we don't want carbon dioxide and they use that stuff up like crazy life is good and uh actually all life that uses cell respiration is very dependent on photosynthesis so uh it's kind of crazy to say this but cell respiration the formula for that is this exact process but in reverse we take in sugars we take in oxygen and then we make water carbon dioxide and some energy this simple diagram does a really good job on showing you exactly all the all the pieces and parts that are added together to make photosynthesis happen you have sunlight you have carbon dioxide and you have water and some minerals that are absorbed by the plants now i want to take the second to point out here and we will be learning about this more in detail but carbon dioxide here is literally absorbed inside of the leaves of most plants that's because there's these small holes and you can see the word down here it's called stomata those tiny holes absorb in carbon dioxide they're also used to help oxygen uh, actually exit out of the plant out of the leaf as uh, it goes through a process called transpiration i also want to mention to you um, the sugars that are made by a lot of plants uh, they get stored in these things called fruits um, i'm sure you've heard of fruit before 
Uh, it's done so that the seeds that are contained in or around that fruit as it falls from the plant supplies food for those seeds so they can grow up into normal healthy plants. But uh, yeah, really sugars are just uh, swollen ovaries of plants. I know that sounds really gross. You're eating the ovary of a living thing. Uh, if I told you, hey, go eat this pig's ovary, you would probably run away screaming. But if I told you to go eat the ovary of this plant, you'd probably say, yum, strawberries. So yeah, that's a weird one. So this has a lot of terminology on it, and I know it's a lot of words, but I think this will help you out, especially when it comes to doing your homework and trying to define some words. But I think it really helps uh, kind of summarize some ideas. So when it comes to defining photosynthesis, it's a process that captures energy from the sun to make sugars that actually store chemical energy. That's an important thing to remember because it doesn't just make energy. It actually stores it in sugars, and then those sugars are later broken down to make the real actual energy used in the plant. Chloroplasts, once again, contain a molecule called chlorophyll, but uh, there's actually two types of chlorophyll that I want you to be somewhat familiar with. They're called chlorophyll A and B. I think it's actually chlorophyll alpha and beta, but anyway, uh, the reason that we have chlorophyll is because light works so that uh, basically it's a, it's a frequency of radiation that and i'm talking about visible light by the way it's a it's a frequency of radiation that bounces off of things and that's what we see well if it's bouncing off the object that means it's not being absorbed and every other color in that color spectrum is being absorbed so this means plants absorb a lot of red and blue light but not very much green that's why they always look green um I should also point out to you uh, another thing about red and blue light is that they're really close to infrared and ultraviolet light, which means plants actually absorb infrared and ultraviolet a lot better because they're, they're absorbing those two sides of the spectrum. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Those thylakoids, those small coin-shaped membrane compartments, um, are found inside of the chloroplast and once again their chlorophyll is contained inside of there. The stroma is contained in that extra space in the chloroplast and and this is usually where uh, you know light will be seen. I might have made that last part up, I don't know. Chloroplasts actually look like this. Actually they're a little bit more squashed. This is kind of a spacious one like a luxury version of a, of a chloroplast but you can see it's got the double membrane which is a good thing to see. We also see individual thylakoids, that's the little little pancake guys here, um, and we see the stack of them, and that's called the grana. And then we have the stroma, which is that space in between. So just try to think about it. I think it looks like a little futuristic city. I don't know why I'm sharing that with you, but it, to me, it looks like what the future is supposed to look like. Green buildings with little land bridges. Look at that. That's crazy. Crazy. I'm probably going to delete this slide later. Um, I should also point out to you, um, we talked about that color spectrum. White light, that, that's the kind of light that we see coming from the sun, is actually containing all visible colors of light. But since uh, not everything in the plant cell is going to absorb each color, the color that isn't absorbed is going to get bounced off. That's why we see green as that reflected light or that transmitted light. Um, and remember, all those other colors are absorbed by the chlorophyll inside of the thylakoids. Now there are two stages of photosynthesis. The first one is called the light dependent reactions and the second one is called the light independent reactions. If I just simply walk you through this, it basically shows you that light dependent means you depend on light. You have to have it. And light independent means you do not require it. So this one needs sunlight, okay? And this one is probably more than likely going to be happening at nighttime. That's supposed to be a moon. Don't judge my moon. It's beautiful. So in, in part one up here, we have the light dependent reaction is when light is actually absorbed. Energy is then moved into the thylakoid because that's what happens with chlorophyll. And then water gets broken down and we release oxygen. And that kind of makes sense because water is made up of hydrogens and oxygens. So we're hiding those hydrogens inside of the, the chloroplast, but the oxygens are released. And then energy that was carried to the thylakoid is moved to the form that we talked about earlier called ATP. Then we start light independent reactions. 
typically, like I said, this could be a good time to be happening during night. We, re we actually add in carbon dioxide, and then the energy from this last step up here is going to be used. And uh, that, that's one of the things that we have to do if we have those uh, stomatas or stoma that are on the outside of the plant cell and they got to open up and close that requires energy so that energy is going to come from part one and then we start to form our simple sugar like i don't know glucose or sucrose something along those lines i know this looks scary and it kind of is but this is what's happening on the inside of a chloroplast each individual um, chloroplast has that stack of thylakoids, the grana, and it's going to be responsible for taking in H2O and sunlight, and it immediately gets rid of an oxygen gas molecule. So we've already eliminated one of those oxygens, and now what should be trapped in here is what's left over is hydrogen and a lot of energy that's contained inside of there. Now this energy, as you can as you can kind of follow here, is making ATP, and there's another molecule that we're not going to talk about too much. It's called NADPH. This goes into this process called the Calvin cycle. Uh, this is really um, what we know light independent reactions as, uh, and honestly, it's a cycle, so it kind of goes back and forth. It's cyclic. Um, we have these two molecule, uh, this molecule called carbon dioxide. This is now absorbed. And then we start to make the simple sugars using that Calvin cycle. And once again, ATP is a reusable molecule. So as we use energy for the Calvin cycle, it drops out that ADP molecule, which then, while inside of those light-dependent reactions, uh, is absorbing some of those uh, light molecules, we have enough energy to add another phosphate to turn it back into ATP. So when we get down to why photosynthesis is important, it's pretty much because all life is, is basically dependent on the sun unless you use chemosynthesis, which we already mentioned. Now, even if an organism doesn't use photosynthesis itself, it does require eating sugars made through the photosynthesis of other organisms. So my example way earlier was a cow eating grass. Well, you probably don't eat grass but you probably eat cows and if you do you're getting your energy from the grass that the cows ate now the next section is going to describe photosynthesis in a lot more detail and it's going to really focus on light independent and light dependent reactions but i do want you to know this there are some factors that can affect how fast or the rate of photosynthesis one of them would be the amount of water because there's hydrogens that are going to be re required and oxygens will be popped off of that. Um, also the amount of sunlight, and that makes sense because if you don't have enough sunlight for plants, they sort of die, uh, and it's hard for them to make sugars from it. But if you really limit the amount of sunlight, they're not able to work in the capacity they're supposed to. And also the type of light. Um, you can actually design experiments where you use different filters on light sources. So you get red light, blue light, green light, and white light and you shine it on plants and you see which one becomes the most effective and the cool thing is some plants work well under certain conditions uh, that are totally different than other plants and this could explain how they learn to evolve in certain sections of the earth because of certain weather patterns or maybe where they're actually located on the earth and where the sun falls on them and the last thing that can really affect them are co2 levels um, plants require co2 the same way we require oxygen so if you really limit your oxygen intake you're not going to work as well and the same thing's true of plants with co2 if they don't get enough they're not going to work as well so now let's take a look at photosynthesis in much greater detail in your book they do a pretty good job on giving you the the steps for all these different processes i would highly recommend you go through and read your book uh, to really kind of follow along with this everything i'm pulling um, is just taken straight out of your book I just use different animations and pictures and I might explain it in a slightly different way but remember your book is a great resource here chapter 4 section 3 so the first stage of photosynthesis is what we talked about earlier uh, it's called a light dependent reaction now this sounds really dumb uh, it's broken down into two parts which we call photosystem 1 and photosystem 2 but don't get too excited no 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 we got to make this super confusing so for some reason and i can't remember why or maybe i never learned it doesn't really matter photosystem 2 actually takes place before 
Photosystem 1 does. And I know that seems weird. Now I've already broken photosynthesis up into two parts, and now for the first part of those two parts, I'm adding two parts, which is just so weird. And then it's named Photosystem 1 and 2, and they're different, and they're in a different order. I'm sorry, you're just going to kind of have to get over that one and learn it anyway. No excuses, kids. None. No excuses. Okay, maybe a little excuse. It is kind of confusing. But still, try to learn it. So, Photosystem 2, once again, not Photosystem 1. We start with Photosystem 2. The thing you got to know is that energy gets absorbed from the sun. The chlorophyll, and there are other light-absorbing molecules, they take in the energy from the sun, and they transfer it uh, to electrons. Now, these electrons then enter the electron transport chain. I'm not going to go crazy into that, but basically, on the membrane of the thylakoid, uh, we, we can transfer or move around electrons to actually change how these things, um, these molecules, ions, kind of flow through the membrane. Uh, using active transport, which we talked about like last section, uh, and we can we can make this energy process happen. Next up for number two, we split our water molecules. Now we use an enzyme to do that, and then oxygen is literally just thrown out of there right from the beginning as a waste byproduct. The leftover electrons are then used to refill. Uh, that used up chlorophyll to kind of keep that energy high and keep things moving along. So what's left over from our water when it was split apart was hydrogen ions. Um, they should have a overall positive charge and basically they're going to get moved through um, through our, our membranes from protein to protein. They're going to kind of hop down through there. Uh, and we use the phrase H plus to describe that those hydrogen ions are in fact positive. Um, and it helps us move them against the concentration gradient, which means it uses energy, which means it's a form of active transport. By the way, you could probably tell that because there's also proteins involved to help us do that. Um, now these electrons are then moved to photosystem one. So we've done photosystem two. Here comes photosystem one. Uh, I do want to show you a picture first. So I kind of labeled this based on the last photo. You can see step one, step two, step three. Uh, this is mostly for you to be able to look at that and compare it to your notes. Um, it's hard for me to flip back and forth just with recording, but we can see inside of the thylakoid uh, that's in this area here. And then we can see out here, we can see the stroma, which is outside of the membrane. Um, basically, we have a high concentration of these hydrogen ions in here, uh, and we want to force more stuff inside. That's what step three is showing us. And uh, when we're transferring these electrons, you can see this little pink electron guy right here. He wants to move along the membrane, and he's going to jump around from protein, that's this big guy, to another protein down through here. Uh, and really, that's going to help us force those hydrogen ions inside. And you can also see where some of those products are. You can see step two here has the water molecules actually getting broken up and releasing oxygen gas. Um, but anyway, well, well, let's get to Photosystem 1. Photosystem 1 is going to be broken up into four parts. The first part states that we're absorbing energy from the sun. And once again, this is a light-dependent reaction, so that makes sense. We, we have to absorb more sunlight. Uh, chlorophyll is going to absorb that for us, and electrons are going to get all charged up, and they're going to kind of do their thing. The next step mentions something called NADPH. Once again, you don't have to memorize everything about this, but I do want you to know it exists, and it acts pretty much just like ATP and ADP does. You'll remember we had that cycle with ATP and ADP, the high energy version and the low energy version. And they can go, you can recharge the low energy version, make a high energy version. It's like the same thing here, but NADPH is considered the high energy molecule, and NADP plus is called the low energy molecule. Um, it's just a basic variation of uh, another energy molecule. Step three, we have these hydrogen ions. Their job is to diffuse through a protein channel. I want you to notice it does say diffuse, which means it's going to go from a high concentration to a low concentration. That's what diffusion is. And it's going to move, th uh, move these ions across uh, a membrane. Now, this is going to flow against a gradient called the chemiosmotic gradient. 
basically it's going to go against the charge. The molecules will still diffuse because they're molecules and they'll go against we go with their uh, concentration gradient, but they'll go against the chemi osmotic gradient. Basically, I'm just trying to tell you, it's going to build up more of a different charge on both sides. One side will end up more positive than it originally started off as. Then step four, we finally change our ADP into ATP when those hydrogens flow through the ATP synthase. This is a special protein um, that kind of helps diffuse things through there, that helps diffuse those ions through there, but also transforms ATP, um, makes ATP from ADP. Now, this is going to be a very important process because it's going to help us make more energy that can be used later on and repeated in a, in a cycle. So this drawing here, or really uh, this, this diagram here, shows us the four parts. I just want to keep in mind, step one here does show that photons are entering. I didn't mention this on the last one, but photons are light molecules. They're the, they're the not molecules, but they're particles. They're particles that are absorbed um, by the, the chlorophyll, uh, and they're, they're, the, they're light particles that charge them up. Anyway, uh, that's what happens here. It enters uh, into our system. And then in step two, uh, we get some of those electrons from way back in photosystem two. Those electrons kind of pass through there, and their job is the, they're added to uh, NADP plus to make NADPH a high energy molecule. And then step three here, we have that uh, large protein called, and very complex protein called ATP synthase. Uh, that's going to move those hydrogen protons through it and it's going to help them actually convert ADP into ATP. And we should end up with some more hydrogens on the, uh, on the outside of the membrane. So that was everything that we just talked about was just the first stage of photosynthesis. Now the second stage is what we call light independent reactions. Um, once again, that's because there's no sunlight actually required here. Uh, and this could be the process that plants really use up at nighttime because you got to think about it. Um, if you live outside, you only get about 12 hours of sunlight and then 12 hours of darkness. It's pretty consistent, guys. It's, it's pretty normal. Anyway, we know this as the Calvin cycle. Um, when I was in school, we only knew it as the Calvin cycle. Nobody really called it the light independent reaction. And if they did, maybe I wasn't paying very close attention. I apologize. I never thought I'd apologize for my high school decisions. But here I am talking about the Calvin cycle. So the Calvin cycle is pretty much uh, set up in a similar way that you're, you're already familiar with when it comes to reusing things. If you remember back to the ATP, ADP cycle, this is kind of like that, but uh, a bit more complex. But once again, it's still a cycle. So we start off with one molecule and we end up repeating that same shape so we can continue that cycle. Now the first step says carbon dioxide dioxide is added to our system. Um, this is added to a five carbon molecule and what we'll do is since carbon dioxide only has one carbon and we already have a five carbon molecule, we're going to rearrange that to make a six carbon molecule. Then in step two, what we do is we make three carbon molecules. So if we have a six carbon molecule, and we split that in half, we end up with two three carbon molecules. Uh, these uh, slightly change their structure based on some other three carbon molecules, but you should just know, it just makes two three carbon molecules. And then these three carbon molecules exit. Actually, it's not all of them, it's just some of them. Uh, but when two of them leave, they bond to make a brand new, newly arranged six carbon molecule. And then, for step four, those three carbon molecules that were left behind are going to be recycled and they will be turned into a five carbon molecule, which we will then reuse to start up the Calvin cycle again. Um, let's look at a picture to make things a little bit easier to understand. So we're going to start up here at the top. We see we have our carbon dioxide, in this case, three carbon dioxides. They're going to be uh, added to our situation where we started off with five uh, carbon molecules. There's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, there's five. And these are going to be added and we're going to make six three carbon molecules. Um, you can also notice there's some P's here. Those are going to be uh, phosphates. Those should sound familiar to you. Um, we're also going to use a little bit of energy here. And you can see this right there. We're going to use 
um, a little bit of energy for this. Uh, we're we're going to talk about glycolysis later on, but we're going to use this energy to basically help us convert um, some of, of these uh, three carbon molecules into some other molecules. And, uh, and then we're going to turn this into, by using a little bit more energy over here, we're going to turn that back into our five carbon molecule. But back here, we have actually released some of those three carbon molecules. And basically when we, I know this looks like a four, sorry, excuse that. Uh, we are going to actually release two of those uh, three carbon molecules newly created. They're going to pop off and then we're going to add some energy and we're going to rearrange that structure so it takes the same five carbon molecule shape at the beginning of our process. This does a little bit better job on showing you exactly what it is we're talking about. Um, I think this does a better job than what is shown in your book, but um, you can look at it. You can make a judgment here. So basically, carbon will enter the cycle in the form of CO2, and an enzyme adds that CO2 molecule to uh, RUBP, uh, and this will form three unstable six-carbon molecules. So they, those are six carbons. You can count the dots. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, and then we'll move on, and we'll make a bunch of these three-carbon molecules. Uh, Basically, it's called 3PGA. You're, you're, you're not going to have to remember the names of these molecules, by the way. Uh, we use a little bit of energy, um, either from uh, actually both NADPH and ATP. And then what we do is we've made a slightly different restructuring of a three carbon molecule. Some of those pop out and then we're left with uh, some leftovers. And then those leftovers are then recycled with a little bit more energy uh, to those same five carbon molecules. And that's it. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate you putting in the time to kind of focus a little bit more on class. I also really appreciate the idea that you sat through the whole thing. If you're listening to me say this, you sat through 30 slides in about 30 minutes or 35 minutes, 37 minutes exactly. So I want to thank you. Um, I also would like you to, if in any way possible, give me some feedback and let me know what worked for you, what didn't. I know there's some options I can change on this. Uh, I know I was writing on the slides and it showed me moving them in real time, but I can use a pointer. Um, it won't leave a permanent mark, but it will kind of disappear. So maybe you don't like me scribbling on the notes and I tried to keep that to a minimum. Also, um, I tried to make sure the vo audio quality was loud enough. Um, and it, you know, I'd much rather have you, it's much easier to turn it down than it is to turn it up. And hopefully you are a better informed student now once again you don't have to listen to these things but uh if you do give me some feedback whenever you do let me know if there's any problems or anything i can help you out with all right guys see you later